Hi everyone, the two knights defense begins e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c5 puts pressure on our f7 pawn, and there are two major moves, bishop to c5, the gioco piano, or knight to f6, and that's the two knights defense, and it's named that because these two knights have developed here. Now playing knight to f6 does invite white to play knight to g5 since we've cut off the protection of that square from our queen and white can attack that f7 pawn and that's going to be the bulk of the video here we will explore. Um, but another move we're going to look at first is the very quiet move d3 just protecting the pawn on e4 and then developing from there and that's a very positional way to play. Uh, other moves are outside the realm of this video because they often transpose to other openings. For example, you can play knight to c3 here, but that's just the four knights game, the Italian variation. Um, you can play d4, but after e takes d4, that transposes into the scotch gambit. Um, you can try castles, I suppose, but I think knight takes e4 is just too strong for black. So that leaves only two moves really, knight to g5 and d3. Let's look at d3 first. So white simply protects their pawn. And now um, we need to decide what to do with our dark squared bishop. It can either play an active role on c5 and try to help in the attack on white's king, or it can play a defensive role on e7. And that's the move I'm going to recommend. That's more in the spirit of the two knights defense rather than the Gioco piano. So the knight, the knight on f6 will, will no longer uh, be pinned if white plays bishop to g5 here. So it's a def defensive bishop. All right, so let's talk about the plans of each side. So each side is going to develop their pieces in a natural way, and they're going to go for pawn breaks. White will attempt to play c3 and d4 to build up the center and attack our center pawn. Meanwhile, we're going to try to attack white's e4 pawn. And there are two plans you could, you could utilize to do that. You can try to prepare the move d5 to attack it, or you can try to prepare f5 to attack it. I'm going to recommend f5 in this repertoire. So to achieve f5, we have to um, get our knight out of the way. We're going to be castling, and when we castle, our king is going to be in line with that bishop, or we're going to have to get that pawn um, unpinned by moving our king over. So there's a lot of preparatory work that goes into these plans. Um, white usually castles here. Black will castle. And now rook to e1. That rook will play a significant role on the e-file. If either player makes it his pawn break and one of these pawns disappears, then that rook will have its effect down that file. Okay, we'll play d6, and that opens up the diagonal for our light squared bishop, which can help support our pawn break to f5. And uh, also it helps guard our e-pawn in case this pawn... Um, gets move, removed, it can capture an f5, for example, and the rook on e1 would be hitting our pawn, so we want to make sure that's solid. So d6 is a typical move. And now there are a lot of different move orders, a lot of different ways you can play from here, so let's just look at one sample. Um, I think a very popular move here is a4, expanding on the queen side, and also uh, gaining an escape square for the bishop. Sometimes black likes to play knight to a5 to harass the bishop and go for the bishop pair. So now the bishop has a square to go to. Okay, we're going to play king to h8. That's my recommendation because we need to release this pawn from its pin if it's going to go to f5. Also, we're vacating the g8 square, and that's strangely enough where our knight is headed. Okay, white may gain more space on the king side or on the queen side with a5, and then we'll stop that pawn from going any further with a6. Uh, c3 is a normal move here to prepare d4. Knight to g8 to release our f pawn, that's our plan. 
Um, we probably don't want to put that knight on d7 and block in our bishop, so it's nice on g8 here. It can come back into the game behind our f-pawn uh, later on. Okay, so white's going to beat us to the center here and make his pawn break first with d4. So you can play f5 here if you want to, but it's quite complicated and tactical, and I think it's better to get things under control first. So I'm going to recommend exchanging pawns on d4 and then pinning this knight on f3. That knight is influencing that e5 square, and that pawn on e4 may want to push forward to e5, so if we eliminate that knight or pin that knight, that's going to dissuade white from uh, pushing that pawn. Uh, in fact, we're threatening to take that knight right now because the g-pawn would be forced to recover it. If the queen moves off of, off of d1, then we'll get that d-pawn. Um, for example, if white simply plays the developing move knight to c3, then we're going to grab that knight, double those pawns, break open the king side, and then we'll make our pawn break with f5. All right, we'll stop this line here. Um, we've enacted our plan of f5. Uh, we can get an attack on that king with that g-file opened up. White still has a strong center to deal with, but we'll get developed just fine. All right, so let's turn our attention to the sharper move uh, in the two knights um, defense, which is knight g5, attacking the f7 square. Now there's only one move to deal with that attack, which is the move d5 to block the bishop's access to that square. There is another rare counterattack called the Traxler counterattack, bishop to f5, um, or c5 rather, but that's usually not considered uh, very good anymore. So we're going to play d5, and we're forking the pawn and the bishop, and that gives white only one possible move here, which is e takes d5. You can't take that pawn with your bishop because we take the bishop and release an attack on the knight, and we're going to go up a piece. And you can't retreat that bishop either because we'll just kick the knight back, and then we'll take this pawn on e4. So there's only one move to consider e takes d5, and now... We're not going to recover our pawn with knight takes d5. If we do that, um, then that's inviting a famous attack called the fried liver attack, knight takes f7, with great complications, and black is on the defensive, and it's very difficult to hold. Um, there's also the move d4 in this position, which is probably even stronger than the fried liver attack. So we're not going to go for those at all. We're going to gambit a pawn. We're not going to recover our pawn. Instead, we're going to play knight to a5 and gain a tempo on this bishop. All right, and now there are two major continuations from here. The first we'll consider is called the Kaiseritsky variation, and that's where white plays d3 to guard their bishop, hoping that we'll take it, and then d takes c4 will solidify the pawn on d5. But we're not going to take that bishop, at least not yet. Instead, we're going to play h6 and drive the white knight back. It will go to f3, and then we'll harass it again with e4 expanding here. White doesn't want to take on e4 because he'll lose his bishop, unless he wants to play for these two pawns versus a minor piece. Uh, but I do like black in that position. So uh, a normal move here... Um, is queen e2 to pin the pawn so it cannot take the knight. Um, and again, we'll just follow one possible continuation to give you a flavor of this Kaiseritsky variation. Um, I would recommend taking that bishop now. We have a knight on the rim which is inactive, and we might as well trade it off for that strong bishop. And then d takes c4, bishop to c5 to develop and get ready to castle. Um, knight f d2 attacks our pawn on e4 for a second time, but we can indirectly defend it by castling. White can't take it now because we're going to have rook to e8 winning the queen. Okay, so instead, uh, white can play knight to b3 to attack our bishop on c5. Now, before um, dropping that bishop back, I recommend playing bishop to g4, attacking the queen. And there's only one move here, which is queen to f1. The only other 
safe square for that queen is on d2, but then the move e3 is very strong, breaking open the position and attacking the white king. So it's going to have to drop back to f1, and we're starting to kind of overwhelm the white position here for the cost of our pawn. Um, and then we're going to play bishop to b4 check, c3, and then drop the bishop back to safety. And the purpose of that maneuver was to draw that c pawn forward to block the natural development of that b1 knight. All right, so we'll stop this line here and just note that uh, white is not castled yet. His queen really can't move anywhere. He hasn't developed hardly at all. So I think we have more than enough compensation for the pawn. All right, so let's go to the main line now. So after um, we move knight to a5, attacking the bishop, okay, most of the time, almost all the time, white will play bishop to b5, check. Now you can block that check with bishop to d7 and then hope to recover your pawn on d5 later. But I think a better way to play is to block the check and just give up the pawn permanently. So we're going to try to play very dynamically, get uh, an extra space advantage and better development for our pawn. All right, d takes c6 is pretty much forced and then b takes c6 attacks the bishop. Now from here, there are three common moves that white can make, and we'll examine each one. First, we'll look at something called the Steinitz variation. In this variation, white drops the bishop back to e2 to safety, and then we kick the knight with h6, and there are two retreat squares for that knight, h3 or f3. f3 is a little more common, but h3 uh, knight h3 is sometimes played, and when white makes that move, it's called the Steinitz variation. Now, don't be tempted to grab that knight just to mess up the pawns there. It's not worth it. Um, white can still safely castle anyway. We don't want to give up our bishop pair. We are playing for peace activity, not to cause a structural weakness in the white pawns. So instead, we're going to develop. Bishop to d6 gets ready to castle. And that's a better square than, say, c5, because on c5, it's blocking our c-pawn. We might want to push that c-pawn forward and fianchetto our light-squared bishop. Um, also, on c5, we might lose a tempo if white goes for the plan a3 and b4. We have to watch out for a fork. So d6 is more sensible. Um, white might develop in any number of uh, manners here. Let's look at an example. Um, d3 to get the dark squared bishop out. I probably wouldn't recommend playing d4, which looks good at first, but I think queen to b6 is a good response for black. So instead, d3 is the more common move. Um, we'll castle to get safe, knight to c3 to develop, and then I recommend centralizing this knight on d5, and we're not afraid of this exchange. We'll just get a strong pawn center if white attempts that. So white will normally castle, and we'll continue to activate our pieces. Rook to b8 is a good move. It's on a half-open file, and it keeps that bishop on c1 at home, guarding that b2 square, at least for the moment. Uh, sometimes white um, fianchettos the bishop, and we can push our c-pawn forward, put our bishop here, and get, get a lot of piece activity. So this is a fine position for black. So let's look at uh, another line called the Soule defense. I had never heard of this. I'm following the names uh, in the Leeches database. Okay, so the Soule defense from this position also involves dropping the bishop back to e2, and we're going to kick that knight, but this time when it falls back to f3, that's the main line um, in this variation called the Soule defense. Okay, now on f3, we are able to harass the knight further by pushing our pawn to e4. And there's nowhere to go except to this very lonely square in the center of the board on e5. It can't go to h4 because we'll just trap the knight there, and it doesn't want to go back to g1, and so the only other place is on e5. Now, there are a few common moves black can make. I'm going to recommend just developing with tempo. Bishop to d6 hits the knight. There's nowhere to move that knight 
um, other than c4, and white doesn't want to give black the uh, move knight takes c4, getting his inactive knight exchanged off. So instead, what white wants to do is defend this knight. There are two ways to do it. f4 has a bad reputation because it, it exposes the king here. It weakens the king side. So almost always what's played is d4 to protect that knight. Okay, we're going to take that pawn en passant, attacking the knight on e5 again. The knight will recover the pawn. Now we'll play queen to c7. That's an excellent move right away, even before castling, because it prevents white from immediately castling. We would have bishop takes h2 check. It also prevents the developing move bishop to f4. So we have uh, quicker development and a lot of open lines for our pieces. We'll stop here. I'll mention we're going to be castling, we're going to be pushing this pawn forward, fianchettoing this bishop so it's pointed at the king side for an attack. This knight can get back into the game probably via the c6 square. All right, so we're doing well in that line as, as well. So let's move on to a different possibility. Once that bishop is under attack on b5, instead of retreating it to e2, another possibility is retreating it to d3, which at first looks really odd to block in your d-pawn like that, but there's a point to it. The point is, if we try to kick the knight with h6 like we did a moment ago, then white has the option of putting it on e4, where it's guarded by the bishop. And from e4, we won't be able to harass it any further like we did when it went to f3. So I'm going to recommend not playing h6 and allowing that knight to go back to e4. Instead, we're going to play knight to d5. This is a more useful way to attack the knight with the queen here, centralizing our knight. And this knight really doesn't want to go back to e4 now when our knight has been removed because we have the move f5 expanding and possibly pushing e4 next. So instead, what white is going to do is drop that knight back to f3. Okay, and that's attacking our e-pawn, so we'll protect it with a developing move, bishop to d6. Um, white will normally castle. We will castle. Rook to e1 attacks our e-pawn for a second time, so we will defend it with rook to e8. And uh, knight to c3 is a possible continuation. And again, we're not afraid of an exchange here giving us a strong pawn center. So we're going to push f5, expanding and threatening a pawn fork e4. So one possible way of dealing with that fork is to drop the bishop back to f1. We will play e4 anyway, uh, knight to d4. And now I recommend the strange-looking retreat knight to f6 for two reasons. One is this knight on c3 can exchange itself for our knight, but once we remove that knight, this knight now becomes very ineffective because we have all of these squares covered by pawns. But another reason to move that knight back there is it is a threat. We're threatening to play bishop takes h2 check with a discovered attack on the d4 knight. All right, we'll stop the position here and just note how much extra space we have and how much better developed we are for the investment of our pawn. And let's look at one last line. Okay, another possibility in this position with this bishop on b5 under attack is the little-known queen to f3, and that's called the Bogolyubov variation. And the point is we can't take the bishop without dropping the rook in the corner. And I wanted to point out what the moves were in the database here. If we look at um, the masters, uh, actually this is the Lee Chess database. This is full of all the games played by all of us amateurs on Lee Chess. And if you look at this database, the most common move for black is bishop to b7 to protect that pawn on c6, which is under attack twice, and also to line up the bishop with the queen. But if you look at the, the percentages here in the bar graphs, you'll see that that move has the worst percentage for black. It gives white 55% wins more than any other move or tied with the move bishop to d7. 
those two protecting moves, protecting that pawn, have the worst results. I think the reason is, well, we're already down a pawn. We don't want our bishop to passively protect a pawn. Our goal is to get active peace play, quick development, more space. So unfortunately, I think the way to go is to make the investment of a second pawn in this position. In fact, let me change to the master's database here. Okay, let's see. Master's database. Oh, all set. If you look at the master's database, look at the top moves. Rook b8, bishop e7, h6, queen c7. It's not until the fifth move that you get one of those protecting moves with the bishop. And bishop to d7 does even worse with masters than it does with amateurs. 63% of white wins. So in this position, I am going to recommend giving up a second pawn and playing the very solid bishop to e7, getting ready to castle. Um, white will undoubtedly take that pawn on c6 with check. We'll take the bishop. Queen takes knight check. Bishop to d7 uh, protects the rook in the corner. And the queen has to move somewhere. For example, it might move to f3. And we are two pawns down, but we have the bishop pair with a lot of open lines. And we have quicker development. Um, white might castle, or will castle actually. White might castle here or play d3 to get the dark squared bishop out. Um, I recommend knight to g4. Just be very aggressive. You have a battery on this knight on g5 here. It's under attack, and it's going to have to move. Uh, maybe it can defend itself with h4, but then we'll just kick it anyway with h6. So it, it's going to have to move maybe back to h3, and then we'll just continue to play. We'll play rook c8, hit another pawn here on c2, and then just continue to be active. We might get the move f5 in and expand soon. We might get bishop to c6 hitting the queen. We can attack that king side. If you check the engine, it says, yes, we have full compensation for two pawns. White has only a plus 0.2 pawn advantage. So this works, and it might be scary, but I think I'm going to give it a try. I want to learn how to play dynamically like this with a pawn or two down. Anyway, if you would like to practice this repertoire and try to memorize it, um, you can check the link below the video and you'll get to this page and there are seven different uh, practice chapters here. You don't have to play exactly what I advocate. It's just a way to get started learning the two knights defense and you can always modify my repertoire or add to it. All right, I hope you learned something from this video. I sure did. Thanks for watching.